establish uh, tribute and barter systems where that makes sense, but gift really plugs up all of the remaining holes, and that's, that's the thing to keep in mind. So the thing to understand about gifts is that there is really very little for you to learn. Um, so just to recap, money is a thoughtless gift. Don't, do not give a gift of money. Uh, giving everybody the same gift is, is kind of bad, if you think about it, because not everybody is the same. And um, you, you have to take individuality into account when, when thinking, thinking of a gift. Not everybody has the same needs. Mm -hmm. Regifting is a little bit iffy. There's usually a statute of limitations of, uh, I don't know, a year or so before regifting. Most people understand that principle. Selling a gift, again, you might do it, but you don't tell the person who gave you the gift that you did it, and most people understand that part too. Um, now, complaining about a gift that, that you got, you know, it's like, again, it's, See, these are, this is a cultural universal. This is, I'm explaining this to you because this is such a sidelined part of, of our economy, whereas it is a, an absolutely central element of a normal economy. So I'm stressing it, but what I'm pointing out is you already know all this. Okay, so boasting about a gift, gift you gave, you know, don't do that. Um, giving too generous a gift, this is something that some people don't actually understand. The unreasonable onus of reciprocation can ruin the relationship. So you try to give a gift that somebody can actually reciprocate in some manner. Um, and of course, the worst thing you can do is give a gift and then not expect reciprocation. That is an absolute insult. Keeping a gift a secret um, is, is generally strange. Uh, generosity is a public virtue done out in the open. There's, there's no, no benefit to being generous if you're the only person who knows it. There are some special cases like well, secret admirers might buy you flowers, but that gets creepy, you know? <laughs> um, don't give trivial gifts. So um, a box of thumbtacks or a bag of onions, no, not a gift. <laughs> but there's an exception. Um, in, in societies that are, where gift and barter are prevalent, um, you, for instance, in Russia, a sack of potatoes is not a gift. Like it, that's an, a rather insulting gift to give to somebody, is a bag of potatoes. But if people are starving, then the taboos of that sort are automatically lifted. So the system automatically adjusts based on needs, not based on rules or custom or anything like that. It, it's flexible enough for that. And uh, making a gift of something you dislike, like I bought this, but I don't really like it, so I'll give it to you. you know, don't do that either. So. The important thing is that gifts are actually uh, amazing in that they bring out the best in us. You know, they, they, they speak to our, uh, to, to our, um, to our, our, our strengths as, you know, as moral individuals. And it's not something that even has to be taught. Now, it's important to stress that certain gifts are not gifts at all. Uh, impersonal gifts, that is, if you don't know the person who's getting it, they're not gifts at all. Largesse is not generosity. Largesse is when you have too much and you give some of it away. So charitable donations are not gifts, endowments are not gifts, other forms of largesse that cannot be reciprocated are not gifts. So they do not give rise to gratitude, they give rise to some actually rather nasty stuff. Um, they give rise to resentment, they give rise to dependency, and they give rise to unjustified feelings of entitlement. This is, again, a cultural universal that you can observe in certain animals. Um, have you ever made the mistake of like, feeding a wild animal somewhere ne near your house? Right? Notice how the animal then shows up day after day expecting to be fed. Notice how mad at you that animal gets if you stop feeding it. There's no debt of gravity, gratitude. It's like, OK, you're a fool. You're feeding me. I will stress that point by biting you if you stop. That is the general relationship with largesse. That, that is not a gift. So the same thing happens with recipients of charity. Charity immediately becomes an entitlement about the second or third time around and remains that way. So a gift that can never be reciprocated can be taken as a form of abuse or an insult. It's, it, it's, it becomes uh, a dysfunctional relationship as opposed to a helpful one. So crumbs from the master's table 
even if somebody accepts them gladly, they create hostility and alienation. And if you have too much, giving it away to people you don't know and care about is not a solution. So back to the antipodes. One, one thing that occurs to people over and over again is that they can buy their way out of this predicament, kind of thinking back to those people who bought me dinner, those money men. Um, so the problem is they don't know how much it will take. Um, the billion is the new million and the trillion is the new billion and they just don't know how much money they'll take so they'll just, they're just trying to run away with all the loot right now and they're kind of getting into a feverish state about it because the point is no amount of money will fix the problem. And there's a belief coupled to that that you can buy your way out of it which which is that the industrial economy can smoothly scale down to boutique size. All of those uh, offshore oil wells, all of those gigantic recoveries, all of those uh, you know, fleets of jet aircraft, etc., can just like smoothly scale down to where they just serve the super rich and, and remain stable. I don't think that that's possible. I don't, as an engineer, I just don't see how that can ever happen. So then they think about, well, what will happen to money? Will it be hyperdeflation or hyperinflation or hyperstagflation? And some people, smart people like Nicole Foss, you know, have taken sides in, in this debate and, and, and uh, um, have a lot, of, um, a lot to say on the subject. But I think the question reduces to, what will be the value of your money once you no longer have any? You know, there are people, there was a speaker here talking about slow money. Um, I think we need to talk about no money. And, you know, people all over this country have this touching faith that the rich will abide, the rich will be with us forever. No matter what happens to the world, somebody will still be rich. And, you know, I think some of them will abide, but if, if enough people owe them personal favors, not otherwise, not, not because they have, um, you know, a banking relationship or, or some gold bullion tucked away somewhere. So the problem with, with all of that kind of thinking is the people who understand finance don't understand physical reality and to some extent vice versa. The, the important thing is that the value of financial assets is backed up by future industrial production which is guaranteed to not happen. There really isn't enough physical measurable stuff, fossil fuels, ores, rare earths, phosphate for industrial agriculture, fresh water, many other things to, to sustain the current level of industrial activity, never mind expanding it. Um, I'm working on putting out a book with uh, Chris Cluxton, who uh, did a very exhaustive survey of all of the non-renewable resources that don't have substitutes, that are absolute requirements for maintaining an industrial base. And his, his conclusion is that there, there can be no physical economic growth at all from this point on. So what that leads us to is that capital assets, all of the stuff that makes a developed country developed, have maintenance requirements. They, they need a certain level of industrial activity in order to be maintained. If they're not maintained, they fall apart, they stop functioning. There's a constant level of investment and reinvestment required to keep airplanes flying, to keep bridges in a condition where you can drive over them, and so on. And, and that is happening already in many, many places. So once you have that, then capital assets become stranded assets. They become scrap. They become useless. And as that happens more and more, the big investment that was made in them that people expect payments on, you know, will, will, will become worthless. The collateral value will go to zero. Now, people are trying to fix this by various techniques basically turning knobs on the system financially. Now the important thing to understand is that nature does not respond to economic stimulus. It does not create more stuff when you print money. It does not respond to price signals. It does not respond to economic incentives or tax policy or any other sort of planning. It is what it is. And, and so as a result of this, money will lose value and as a result of that, it will also lose respect. People will show up with all their money and they will be told, 
your money is no good here, sir, please go away. And that will continue to happen until the message sinks in. So, for as long as we have this dominance of money and commerce, we have th roughly this organization scheme in society. So, basically, how, how big a person you are in society depends on how many dollar signs there are next to your name. So, you have millionaires, billionaires, maybe some trillionaires at the top. If you have more money, then nobody will oppose you. And um, so, why should, why should it be like this, do you think? Um, it's not really absolutely obvious looking at this chart why it should be that way, but if you flip it upside down, and that's where the, the explanatory power of my upside down metaphor really shines, I think, the antipodal orc chart makes a lot more sense when, it, when it's flipped upside down because now money just drains downhill due to gravity toward the greediest, stingiest, mo morally lowest individuals. And it makes perfect sense. This economy is driven by gravity. <laughs> so to enter into antipode society, um, you have to take on a role, uh, an economic role. So you have to classify yourself. You, you can be an employer, an investor, an employee, an official, a professional, a skilled worker, an unskilled worker, retired, disabled, or you don't really exist. Now, that's also a very important thing because more and more people in this country every day don't really exist. They're not unemployed because their unemployment benefits have run out, right? So as soon as that happens, you're no longer unemployed. You don't exist. And, and um, it's the fastest growing class we have in the United States today. Examples include recent college graduates with no prospects of employment. Two-thirds of them are moving back in with their parents, if they can. People whose unemployment ran out, a uh, big category. Retirees with insufficient retirement or savings, and that, that's happening more and more as uh, uh, various types of uh, retirements um, especially uh, you know, the, the municipal retirements and so on, uh, turn out to be broke. The, the accounts turn out to be broke. And, and uh, young people who are not entering the labor market, who uh, uh, don't get into college and can't get a job. So saying goodbye to the antipodes is what we should all be doing because we don't want to collapse along with them. Things you can do to uh, make it to, to, to sort of slowly drop out of the system, I suppose, as opposed to uh, all at once, is not really define yourself too well. So you can be a freelancer or a hobbyist or a volunteer. Nobody knows what you really are, but, but you get along anyway. <laughs> and, and the important thing is to just like, you know, not, not get pegged down to any given category that the system comfortably deals with. And uh, use your residual money to reduce and eliminate the need for continued cash flow. So anything you can do that, you can, that allows you to get stuff for, for free from, from your community or from your friends or, or do for yourself, that's a step in the right direction. And the idea is to create closed cycle systems that are very local for, for things that you really need, like food production, like shelter maintenance, like transportation. Entertainment is a big category. People spend a lot of money on that. Uh, reduce, reduce your dependence on impersonal relationships and institutions. You, you know, that this, this, is, this is hard for some people, but um, I think that y you have to basically kind of do a drill, in maybe just a kind of a, a mental drill. What happens if such and such an institution no longer exists? What is my mechanism for compensating for that? And shy away from using monetary equivalents and, and try to rely on gifts and uh, various types of extensions and generalizations of gifts as much as possible. You can create new sorts of customs and rituals within, among your friends and within your local community that help transform it into more of a gift and barter economy and, and allow you to create a, the, the sort of culture that, that will stand a chance. I think that's it. That's it. Thank you.